I want to turn our, our hearts to the, to the Word of God this morning. I want to invite Bill Hogg to come and join me. And uh, Bill is going to be opening up God's Word to us this morning. We're glad that Bill could put, come and be with us. Uh, Bill actually is um, he's spending some time with our Board of Elders and uh, Pastor Ryan as we're talking about uh, a little bit about uh, how we can think about disciple making and church planting in some unique ways, ways that uh, we certainly have never done before. And so pray for, for us as we kind of even meet over lunch today and spend the afternoon together um, pursuing uh, some, some possibilities. And uh, we, we're looking forward to that. But, uh, but Bill is, uh, is a man after God's heart. He is an evangelist at heart. Um, he's got an awesome accent. You're going to love that. But more than that, you're going to love uh, what God has to say to you through Bill's uh, God's servant today. So welcome, Bill, and uh, may, may you experience God's blessing on you today. Thanks so much, Rob. Great to be here with you. Good to be in Prince George and to meet up with the Westwood family. Sadly, there am I allowed to say that? Sadly, not face-to-face, not in person, but through live stream. The good news is we can take wisdom even from a crushingly polite Anglican, Nicky Gumbel. Nicky Gumbel reminds us, the Holy Spirit is not confused by Zoom. So, so the good news is you can have a profound Jesus encounter in your gym jams having your third coffee of the day, and God's Word can land in your heart in a surprising way. So we would love to be face-to-face because, as a friend of mine said, you can date online, but you can't get married online. You can't have an online marriage. And that's true of the church. We're not Gnostics. We don't believe in a disembodied spirituality. Christianity is the most materialistic of all religions. Why? Because we believe in the resurrection of the body, and we follow the indestructible Jesus, who's the first fruits of the resurrection. But as we meet, God fulfills a promise where He says, draw near to me, and I will draw near to you. So, I'm fidgeting with my iPhone because I'm putting on a timer, just in case I start going, and uh, I do a 50-minute Rob Thiessen special, so we don't want that to happen this morning. But great to be with you. You're in a series top model, and you'll be transitioning into Advent as we remember that the Word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood that Jesus is God with a postal code. As Robert Farrer Capon said, Jesus is God in all his Clark Kentness, or as we sing, veiled in flesh, the Godhead see. And it's a wonderful time uh, to hunker down, worship the Lord Jesus, oh, come let us adore him, and celebrate his first coming, and anticipate the renewal of all things when he'll come to wrap up human history. But I'm kind of doing a little diversion, bearing in mind Jesus is our top model for mission. And I want to speak this morning on the Jesus way of mission, or mission the Jesus way. Jesus says in John 20, 21, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. In other words, He is the way, the truth, and the life, and He is the way of mission. He's the paradigm for missional engagement, missional leadership. We love Him, we follow Him, we worship Him, we adore Him, and He's the pioneer who beckons us to follow Him into the Canadian mission fields. Uh, Last time I was up here, I've been up here and hanging out with Pastor Ryan, your Go Pastor. That's a great job title. Put that on a business card. What are you? I'm the Go, 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 Go. And he is a bit of a dynamo, so that's appropriate. But he's Uh, And we are being brooding and dreaming and scheming about what it would look like to innovate on mission in partnership with Westwood MB. And that's been a whole load of fun. So it's been good to to hang out with him. And the last time I was up here was in the dead of winter, about six years ago. A perfect, impeccable timing. Uh, It was a snow dump from the heavens, maybe a manifestation of the wrath of God on Prince George. I don't know. But it was rough. And I came up here, spoke at a few services, did a Becoming Good News People workshop, and I had the flu the whole time. So now they wouldn't even let me on a plane if I had the flu, but I came up. And at that time, I posted on Facebook, hey, friends, sick as a dog, but doing it for Jesus, Westwood MB, please pray for me. And my friend, who when we first met her, Susan, who said, 
I'm an atheist. Prove to me that God exists, as my wife poured her a glass of wine. I became an agnostic, and she featured on my Facebook wall, praying for you. And I thought, maybe the atheist who became an agnostic has become a believer. And that could even be you this morning. So back then, I had a role with a church planting network. I'm now the National Director of Message Canada, which is a three-year-old missions agency in Canada, but part of a global movement that's 30 years old. And we're about the business through a ministry called Advance of Encouraging, Identifying, Mentoring, and Multiplying Evangelists. We're also into deploying downwardly mobile teams of urban missionaries who relocate to broken postal codes to bless and elevate the poor, and that can support a church planting strategy. We're also committed to creative mission. October 1, Chrissy Atkins came on board as our creative missions coordinator, and we're using the creative arts to disciple and mobilize Christian young people and reach lost young people, and we're also in the business of training. We want to serve and support and be a blessing to the body of Christ, and in particular, equip the people of God in Canada, in the body of Christ, to follow Jesus faithfully and fruitfully on mission. And of course, that overused word, like most of us, we've had to pivot, pivot, pivot. A friend of mine didn't like the word, so he says, oscillate. So if you listen to him preaching online, his word to his flock is, we've got to oscillate, oscillate, oscillate. But we've had to adapt. We've recognized that my original three-year plan went in the shredder. And so when I came on board in August 1, 2019, we held an evangelist summit in Calgary because I wanted to gather the endangered and threatened species, identify the invisible men and women who are missing in action, the evangelists, encourage them, lay hands on them, pray that the Spirit of God would activate them to do the work of an evangelist. And we had an awesome time. There was 80 gathered from across the country. Uh, we were supported by agencies like the Luis Palau team and Dave Jones, Luis's VP said, buddy, if you get 35 at your first ever evangelist summit, that's a home run. I phoned them when 57 registered, and we sat in a way too small room with 80 of them in a hotel in Calgary. And I thought, hey, this was sweet. Let's do this again. But there was the matter of the universe changing in March 2020. So over the past 18 months, we've maybe trained a thousand evangelists and leaders online to engage boldly, winsomely, humbly in the business of evangelism. But today, I want to speak about mission the Jesus way. And of course, we could plunder a bunch of scriptures to look at how Jesus summons, invites us, beckons us to join him on mission, because really the call to follow Jesus is a call to follow him into a broken world on mission. And so I'm going to turn in my NIV Bible, the nearly infallible version or those of you checking in from Belfast, the Northern Ireland version, and I'm going to read from Matthew 9, 35, through to the first few verses in Matthew 10. It's page 970 from the Bible you stole from the hotel and never returned. So, Matthew 9, 35 says, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Jesus called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip, and Bartholomew, Thomas, and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. These 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. And what did he say? 
Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons freely. You have received freely give. Do not get any gold or silver or copper to take with you in your belts. No bag for the journey or extra shirt or sandals or a staff, for the worker is worthy of his keep. So that was a bonus verse that didn't appear on live stream, and it's all good because it's the Word of the Lord for us this morning. Now, you ever asked yourself the question, what does Jesus see when he looks at Canada, when he looks at British Columbia, when he looks at Prince George, what does Jesus see when he looks at our culture? And there's an idea that's creeped north of the 49th parallel, that our culture is a battlefield. But when we follow Jesus on mission, we discover he looks with eyes of compassion. And he doesn't see a battlefield where we engage in culture wars to impose our moral agenda on the nation. He looks with eyes of compassion at a mission field, and he invites us to join him on his mission. Christopher Wright said, the mission of God is the commitment of God to make himself known to his creation ultimately for the purpose of redeeming and restoring all creation to its right relationship with God. So God has a mission, and the mission as a church, and we are followers and worshipers of a missionary God who calls us to be agents of his kingdom, agents of his mission. And Canada is a mission field. Back in 1961, one half of 1% of Canada would say, we have no religious affiliation whatsoever. About 12, 18 months ago, the Evangelical Fellowship of Canada conducted a survey, and they declared zero is new normal. What does that mean? For the average Canadian, church engagement, the norm is zero a week, zero a month, zero a year. The Evangelical Fellowship of Canada came up with a new composite category because we've heard about the nuns and duns. There are perhaps in BC 35% since the last survey, probably creeping up to 40% of those who live in British Columbia would say, I have no religious affiliation whatsoever. But the EFC created a composite of atheists, agnostics, and spiritual but not religious, AASN. And they said 50% of Canadians are AASN. So we're in a strange moment where Canada is densely populated with self-sufficient secular moralists who are without God and without hope in the world. And yearning for yesteryear won't bear fruit in the moment that we find ourselves in. And in this moment, Jesus calls us to follow him on mission. Matthew 9, 35 to 38 is something of a summary and transition passage. The language that the gospel writer uses is to make us look back and to make us look forward. It's a tight, tidy summary of Jesus' ministry activity, where we're told he's teaching in the synagogues, he's preaching the kingdom, he's preaching the message of the kingdom. Matthew likes kingdom of heaven, other gospel writers, kingdom of God, and he's healing the sick and driving out demons. And this summary of Jesus' activity is a similar summary to what we find in Matthew 4, 23, 24, round about that postal code, where there's a summary of Jesus who comes on a rescue mission, Jesus who comes to reveal the heart and love of God, Jesus who comes to kickstart his kingdom, Jesus who comes to die on the cross for our sins so that we can be reconciled to God, Jesus who abolishes religion and opens up a new and living way to God where we can have intimate friendship with God and become the dwelling place People individually in a community indwelt by the Spirit of God. He's on mission. 
But then there's a transition, and we find the 12 are now agents of Jesus' mission. They are now agents of the kingdom. What's Jesus doing? He's declaring the message of the kingdom of God and demonstrating the kingdom. Jesus' ministry is catalytic for an inbreaking and demonstration of the rule and reign of God, and His message orbits and facets around the kingdom. But here, He passes the missional baton onto the twelve. In the parallel passage in Luke chapter 10, we find in Luke 9, the twelve are sent on mission, and then in Luke 10, the 72 are sent on mission. Now, why is that important? It's important because we are all called to mission. Jesus has a mission, and He mobilizes the twelve, and we have them in a contact list in Matthew 10. And then in Luke 10, the 72. They're anonymous. We don't get a telephone directory listing of their names, but we are reminded we're all called to follow Jesus on mission. Jesus said, the man from heaven has come to seek and save that which was lost. He came on a search and rescue mission. David Bosch says the mission of the people of God is to alert men and women to the rule and reign of God in Jesus. And the historian Harnack said, when the church won its greatest victories in the early days of the Roman Empire, it did so not by teachers, preachers, or apostles, but by informal missionaries. And that's the heart of God, that the whole church takes the whole gospel to the whole world. And this passage shows us how. How do we put that into practice? How do we follow Jesus on mission? So firstly, we need to look. Jesus invites us to look. In John 4, 35, He says, I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. And here, in Matthew 9, 37, He says, the harvest is plentiful. Look at the harvest. It's plentiful. There's an abundant, unprecedented harvest waiting for us. But there's a problem. The workers are few. It's a day of opportunity. The harvest is plentiful, but it's a day of crisis and challenge. The workers are few. And in this pandemic moment, which we find ourselves in, it's actually a challenge, a crisis, an assault on our mental health in some cases, in some spaces. We've all struggled. But at the same time, it's a day of opportunity. I was speaking at the Church Planting Canada Congress that was supposed to be a live in-person gathering in Cowtown in Alberta, and it ended up being a live stream, so we're in First Assembly Calgary with the cast of characters who are producing and presenting. And I was to do a a session on mission in post-pandemic Canada. And my first comment was, guess what? It's not post-pandemic Canada. We're still in the middle of it. And I'd read some pessimist who said, we're in a pandemic era. But what has the pandemic done? It's raised profound existential questions in the hearts of self-sufficient people who've subscribed to the myth that they are invincible, that they are the masters and mistresses of their own destiny. But it's raised questions of the fragility of life, our own mortality, the specter of death, What's the point? And so there's an opportunity for us as the Spirit has been chipping away at the self-sufficiency of secular moralists, haunting those who once walked with Jesus and beckoning them to return. There's an opportunity for us to give a reason for the hope that lies within. Alan Hirsch has said, for the church, both forms of adaptive challenge present us with very real issues in our day. A threat to the existence of the institutional church comes in the form of rapid, discontinuous change, and compelling opportunity comes in the form of massive, almost unprecedented openness to issues of God, spirituality, community, and meaning. And I think the pandemic has amplified that, that it can't be business as usual. 
Sure, we need to take a page from the uh, playbook of the apostle Jim Collins, who says, confront the brutal facts. Let's weigh and assess the challenge that we face. But at the same time, there's an opportunity as people are wrestling with the issues of mortality, community, and meaning. And Jesus invites us to look. Where are you looking? Are you looking at the harvest fields? Josie Chaco, a serial church planting catalyst, said, do you have a barn mentality or a harvest mentality? Barn means we're fixated on internal operations in the life of the institutional church. But if we have a harvest mentality, we look out and we see that Jesus is always right, and he's right in this moment, that there's a plentiful harvest, and we need to navigate ways in which to communicate the timeless truths of the gospel and decode it in a way that makes sense for people with no spiritual memory. So we're called to look, but we're also called to love. Here, Matthew reveals what fueled Jesus' relentless kingdom activity that was his heart beat furiously with the love of God. It says here, using a kind of violent verb that would speak to having a gut reaction or a bowel movement, Jesus is moved with compassion. He stirred in the depths of his guts, in his kidneys, in his internal organs, if you were a literalist, but I'm not a literalist. What does it tell us? It tells us that Jesus has a visceral reaction when he looks out at the crowds because they're harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And his guts went out to the people and his heart went out to the people because they're spiritually clueless. They're stumbling around in the dark without a spiritual compass and they're frayed at the edges. And he looks out, and he's moved deeply with compassion for them. Jesus invites us to love. Now, in Message Canada, we're committed to deploying teams of downwardly mobile urban missionaries into broken postal codes called Eden. And my wingman in that endeavor is a veteran church planter, who's very interculturally savvy. He planted a fruitful gospel church in Ecclesia, which is a Marxist anarchist community in Athens, Greece. And he and his wife Mariko and their kids were there as pioneer missionary evangelists for eight, nine years. Then during the economic downturn, their visas were rescinded by the Greek government. And he's come back to Canada And he's our Eden mobilizer coming alongside those who want to use Eden as a church planting strategy. He's a catalyst. He's a coach in gospel fluency, team building, community exegesis. But Heath and I were hanging out, and he told me that he'd been living in this passage that we read for two years, Matthew 9, 35 to 38, where we're struck by the compassion and relentless, furious tenderness of Jesus, the immeasurable compassion of Jesus as he sees a swathe of broken, lost humanity, and he's moved with compassion. So in response to that, Heath had just been immersing himself in that passage of Scripture, and he prayed a prayer. Help me to see people like you see people. Help me to have compassion like you have for people. And he would go back, rinse, and repeat park in the Scripture, which is a great discipline. If we want to experience spiritual transformation is to meditate on the Scriptures, pray the Scriptures back to God, memorize the Scriptures, park in the Scriptures. And as he prayed this prayer, God answered. One day, God spoke to him and said, you've been praying for this, now walk with this guy. Now, who was this guy? This guy is Chris, and Chris has given me permission to share his story for your encouragement. Chris is a transgender person who was living in the downtown east side of Vancouver. Suicidal, self-harming, addled with drugs, and he journeyed along with Chris. Chris tried to top himself. He visited him in hospital. He would text Heath and say, I'm going to kill myself. I'm going to end it all today. And he said, don't do that. I'm praying for you. Chris would say, why? Why are you praying for me? Why do you care? 
because I love you. And better than that, God loves you too. So they began to get into gospel conversations. And during one of the conversations, Heath prescribed a a spiritual action plan. He said, I'd like you to read Augustine's Confessions. Now, that's an unlikely evangelism strategy. If you've been to an evangelism workshop, if Ryan's training you in gospel conversations, he's probably not going to say, huck a copy of Augustine's Confession at your unregenerate neighbor and tell them to chew on that for a while. But Chris did the spiritual homework, and they checked in with each other. And Heath said to Chris, so, tell me what's been going on. I read Augustine's Confessions, and, and I did something I not done before, well, not done in a very long time. What's that? I prayed out loud to Jesus. Okay, you prayed out loud to Jesus. Well, what did you pray about? Well, I figured that if God could save Augustine from his life of debauchery, God could rescue me. So I prayed and asked Jesus to forgive me of all my sins. And then, says Heath, and I think he has. And so Heath begun to disciple Chris. In 1 John, which is a pretty stark binary book, God, devil, darkness, light, sin, holiness. And during one of their journeys in 1 John, Chris said to Heath, you're you're not affirming, are you? No, but I am loving. Yes, you are. Currently, Chris is in rehab every Sunday. He's an evangelist. He brings eight of his rehab buddies to church, and he leads a community group. Now, why do I tell you that? Because the love of Jesus is without scope and limit. He has redemptive power. God fulfills a promise when He says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And Jesus calls us to get in the mess of broken people's lives, to be agents of love, and to love the lost, the broken, and love confused people. Maybe the first scripture you ever memorized if you were weaned in Sunday school was John 3.16, which still makes a cameo appearance at NFL games. In the end zone, from time to time, you see, used to see the guy with a clown wig in John 3.16, and people go, who's John 3.16? Is it a phone number? No. It's a postal code in the Bible. Read it. And it says, for God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son that whoever believes on him should not perish but have everlasting life. And what does that tell us? Jesus came on a rescue mission. That's what we celebrate through Advent. That's what these Christmas carols in language from a bygone era, celebrate and declare God has come amongst us to ransom, heal, restore, rescue, transform, forgive, reconcile, and He does so fueled by immeasurable love. For God so loved the cosmos that He sent His one and only Son. And God wants us to experience His love that his love would come into the thirsty inner places in our inner man, inner woman, would be transformed by the love of God, and would be conduits of the love of God. Octavius Winslow said, who delivered up Jesus to die? Not Judas for money, not Pilate for fear, not the Jews for envy, but the Father for love. So Jesus says, look, love, and then pray. So there's a problem here in Matthew 9. The harvest is plentiful. The issue isn't the harvest. The issue is the workforce. And Jesus' remedy is this. Matthew 9, 38, Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. It's harvest time. Pray. Now, back at the start of the pandemic, I participated in the Great Commission Day of Prayer which was an online Zoom gathering with almost 900 Zoom windows open. It was like the Brady Bunch on psychedelic drugs. It, it was crazy. And so you would, if you were bored, you could go page, 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 and see who's on, who's on the window. And I had the privilege of speaking at that and participating in that. And I debriefed with Sarah Maynard, who was one of the organizers. Sarah leads the Red Leaf Prayer Network. And as we talked about the Great Commission Day of Prayer, where they gathered in cyberspace for eight hours 
intercessors from all across the provinces, praying from Canada from sea to sea, praying for Canada. Sarah said, Bill, I've never been in all my years of leading a prayer network and engaged in national prayer ministry in a gathering that had such an extended, protracted focus on the harvest. Now, why did that strike me as significant? Because God has a heart for the harvest. And if he mobilizes and anoints and inspires the intercessors to pray for harvest, he doesn't do it to troll them or disappoint them. That maybe it's on the heart of God that we are on the cusp in our brokenness and our vulnerability where we figuring out slowly we can't control the climate, we can't control the elements, and our infrastructure is broken, maybe we'll wake up to the fact that we are broken and call on the Lord, and in His kindness, He'll pour, pour out His Spirit, and we will see a harvest. It's harvest time. And here Jesus says, pray earnestly that the Lord of the harvest ekbalos workers into the harvest field in the Greek. That's a violent word used of Jesus' exorcism ministry. He would hurl demons, chuck out demons, expel demons, cast out demons. So here that violent word used for liberating someone from demonization is used for deploying workers into the harvest field. As Pastor Rob mentioned some time ago, for several years, I was involved in a church planting network, and we would latch on to the parallel passage. Oh, timer. But it's okay. It's time added on for injuries, like when Cristiano Ronaldo pops up to score a header, and all is well. And we were inspired by Luke 10, verse 2, and we would set our watches to 10.02. And I was down in the U.S. meeting an old mentor who's very advanced in years now, but involved in lots of global missional convocations. And he said to me, so Bill, you're involved in church planting. What is your recruitment strategy? And I said, Luke 10, verse 2. He said, yes, but what is your recruitment strategy? I said, read my lips. Ask the Lord of the harvest to send our workers into the harvest fields. I think he got the point. And here, Jesus prioritizes prayer because mission isn't a humanistic endeavor. The Bible says, unless the Lord builds the house, those that labor, labor in vain. God says, not by might nor by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord of hosts. And Jesus invites us to pray. Prayer here is a missional priority. Prayer is a posture where we agree with Jesus in John 15, where he says, without me, you can do nothing. And here Jesus calls for a prayer focus, the disruptive deployment of harvesters who will engage with lost people and be agents of hope and healing and reconciliation and redemption. So I don't care if you set your watch from 937, 938, or 1002. There's a spiritual dynamic that Jesus invites us into that we pray, that we pray that God will raise up evangelists and scatter them across Canada, that we pray that God will raise up Eden teams. We pray that God will send out micro church planters from Westwood family to be agents of hope and healing and reconciliation. Years ago, when I still lived in God's country, which you'll find in the back of your Bible, and there it's in Tartan Paint, Scotland, there was an advertising campaign on the TV for Audi, those beautiful specimens of German auto engineering. And you would see one of the commercials, there was an Audi gliding along the autobahn, and at the same time, there was a glider in the sky moving silently through the air. And there is the Audi moving silently through the autobahn. And so that was fun. And then there was another one where a bunch of vacationers got into a beat-up VW van that sucked with no air conditioning, and a disheveled family eventually arrived on vacation, but they were beaten by whom? The family that owned an Audi with air conditioning, jawohl. And they get there first, and they're sunning themselves by the pool, and the other family are dripping with sweat. And at the end of every commercial, Jeffrey Palmer, an English actor with a beautiful butterscotch voice would say, Audi, or as the Germans say, Vorsprung Technik. 
Now, I was once on a plane and was speaking to a Mennonite from Paraguay. I said, buddy, don't think anybody's ever asked you this. Could you translate Vorsprung technique for me? And he said, advanced through explosion. But he was wrong because I fact checked. It's advanced through technology. And that's the North American missional paradigm that we advance through planning, technology, programs, methodology. But Jesus, who beckons us to follow him, Jesus in Matthew 10, who says, freely you have received, freely give, live a life of sacrifice, surrender, and kingdom generosity. Jesus says, pray. Pray. So we are called to look We're called to love the unlovable, which requires the supernatural work of God in our withered hearts. And Jesus says, pray. Pray so that we're attentive to the Spirit. We join Him in what He's doing. Pray because we can't get it done. Pray. Breathe on me, breath of God. Fill me with life anew. Use me as a man or a woman who's a signpost of the kingdom, who points people to Jesus. Fill me, Lord In my empty soul, fill me with your love. Fill me with the fragrance of Jesus. Fill me and anoint me with your power. Lord, I can't do this on my own. I need you. Every hour, I need you. Lord, it's me. It's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. God bless you. As Pastor Rob comes and wraps up for our time together today. Now, before we, before we close, um, on that note, would you pray for our church family? Sure. You've, just, you've challenged us. You've given us some things to laugh about. But through the humor and the laughter, Jesus has a very specific message. Mm. Would you pray for us? I'd be glad to. Father, I thank you so much for this church family, Westwood, uh, populated by great saints, struggling sinners, wonderful people who've served you fruitfully and faithfully through the years. And I pray for a fresh day of fruitful missional engagement here in this community. And we recognize, Lord, we can't work this up or engineer it. We need the breath and power of God. So we pray, Spirit of the living God, that you would descend upon the leaders, the workers, the families here, and ignite them with fresh passion for Jesus, holy boldness, elevate sensitivity to your spirit, Lord. I pray that your spirit would be speaking prophetically uh, into the leaders about the way forward to serve and bless Prince George and for Westwood to be in greater and greater measure a community of blessing where people uh, encounter you, encounter your mercy, encounter your hope, your generosity. So we pray from this family, you would raise up missionaries overseas, but right here in Prince George. We pray that you would raise up evangelists, Lord, at 1002. We pray, Lord, that you would uh, deploy anointed men and women who with bold humility would declare the good news of Jesus on the street corners, in the offices, in the places of recreation, wherever you give opportunity, Lord. We pray for a wave of the Spirit that would uh, release fresh and fruitful missional engagement for the glory of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen and amen. Thank you so much, Thanks. Bill. And if you would remember to pray for, uh, for us as we uh, meet over lunch and over the course of this afternoon with, with Bill and uh, Pastor Ryan for the next uh, few hours, uh, we are looking forward to what God has for us. And as Bill mentioned even before, we're, we're entering into Advent, and what, a, what, what better way to begin Advent than to actually be challenged with, with a message like this. And so let's, let's look, let's love, and let's pray as we, we enter into this amazing season. So as we enter our worship service this morning, uh, take a look at this video. We're inviting our church family uh, to love uh, some of uh, the needy in our, in our community. And uh, we trust that you're going to participate over the next four weeks as we uh, worship Jesus through Advent. God bless you. Have a great week. Hello, everyone. I am so excited to tell you about a great opportunity we have this Christmas season to partner with the Salvation Army Food Bank. The Salvation Army Food Bank this year is experiencing greater demand 
than they have in a long time. And with that great demand, they also do not have the resources they, they need to meet that demand. And so here's where we have an opportunity to come alongside and bless them. One thing that we are gonna do here at Westwood Church is we are going to do a financial drive and we are encouraging you to give a donation to Westwood Church, but designate it Food Bank. And when you do that, and your gift is added up together with others, you'll see that we can make a significant difference. But there's even better news than that, because the elders have designated $10,000 to go towards a matching program. So that means that up to the first $10,000 that donated to Westwood Church for the food bank, we can match dollar for dollar, which means that your one can become two. But there's even better news than that. Through different matching programs the Salvation Army has, they can actually take the two and make it four. And so, what an incredible opportunity this is. Instead of just being able to give, say, one soup can, your one soup can becomes four through giving it financially. And so I just want to encourage you this Christmas season, would you give a gift to Westwood Church and designate it to the food bank so that we can make it really stretch and make a huge impact in our community for those who are experiencing food security issues. And so you can do that by going online, you can do that through e-transfer, you can do that by stopping by the office and dropping off cash or a check, but whatever you do, just make sure that you market food bank. And let's all generously give and work together to really make a significant difference this year for the Salvation Army Food Bank. Have a Merry Christmas. God bless you.